pieces of the of videos that are added. Um, I think it's going to be 20 people. Uh, so we're going to see if maybe others uh, of our Montana um, you know, family has joined before uh, we actually start um, while we're waiting for this to actually happen <laughs> or not happen. <laughs> I will introduce myself and say a little bit about the program. So my name is Cicely Whitworth, and this is my sign name. I live in Missoula. I am deaf or became deaf uh, during high school. That's when I lost my hearing. Now I'm labeled as a late deaf and adult. I work as an ASL instructor, um, the early intervention advocate um, in uh, Montana. Uh, one of my projects that I've been working on since the beginning of the program is Montana, Montana Family ASL, and it started from uh, COVID when the pandemic hit for the families who wanted to become bilingual um, in English and ASL, but um, they don't currently have access to interactions with uh, deaf individuals or haven't been taking classes, so they've been very limited uh, in that aspect. Um, there's a limited availability of resources. So Montana Tana Family ASL program um, was designed to actually try to uh, support or help with that situation, providing parents uh, coaching and guidance for those parents um, who are learning ASL and then at the same time uh, who want to try to I encourage their child to actually pick up ASL as their first language. So um, that's our goal with the program. And right now <laughs> we kind of swayed away from that. Usually I talk about ideas for activities that we could do with the kids to play games and um, how to actually encourage families to actually practice ASL. But today we're thrilled to have a guest speaker, Dr. Sarah Sparks. Um, who is a deaf audiologist and uh, currently um, it has a PhD, is in the PhD program, is that right? Yes, okay. And uh, she is here and plus she has two cochlear implants. Uh, before she had, uh, well, she was a hearing aid user and she could talk actually about implants the sounds and, and from those implants and just different perspectives. Um, so there's a, whoo, a lot of responsibility for you, Sarah, but her per personal in, in, um, experience with hearing loss and with hearing aids and uh, wearing cochlear implants and her experiences as an audiologist working with deaf children. Um, she has experienced uh, a deaf student, as a deaf student and a, a deaf professional in the workplace, she is experiencing that. So I'm excited to actually hear from Sarah about those different things. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop with my introduction now, and I'm going to repeat my instructions about um, access features. Um, so we currently have um, ASL interpreters. And we also have ca captions. Um, you should currently be able to see me and one of the two ASL interpreters on the screen and then also Sarah Sparks. Um, also, uh, we do have captioning on the bottom. Um, if you cannot see that, um, you could uh, select CC and you'll see a drop down and then you can select subtitles there. Um, we also, um, it will also show uh, the English um, words. Um, I am gonna turn it over to, turn the show over to Sarah. I'm gonna ask everybody except Sarah and the interpreter to please turn off your cameras uh, for the presentation. After Sarah is done with her presentation, I will show up again, you'll see me. And if you have any questions or comments um, or anything, you can either respond by using the raise your hand uh, feature, or you can type your comments in the chat or questions in the chat. Uh, you can turn on your camera uh, when I call on you, 
uh, to ask questions or I can actually uh, give those questions over to Sarah and then uh, I, we can review that again uh, when the time comes. Um, now for now, we're gonna turn it over to Sarah unless anybody has any technical difficulties we need to solve currently right at this very moment. Hopefully everything's okay. Um, I don't see any messages or comments or anything regarding that. So um, hold on. Sarah, are, are you a currently co-host? Oh, not yet. Okay. Amanda, um, I can't um, give her co-host. Co okay. All right. Great. So I'm going to turn off my camera and uh, Sarah, take it away. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with all of you tonight. Um, just a couple of things before I get started. One, um, I uh, do communicate in both English and ASL. Um, I'm choosing tonight to present in English, um, but I just want to make sure that everybody knows um, I value both languages perfectly equally. I transition back and forth between them in my daily life on a regular basis, um, but primarily because I was told that most likely the majority of people who would be here tonight would be hearing parents of deaf and hard of hearing children, um, I decided to present in English. Um, so I will be presenting in English. The other thing is, I'm curious to know who is here tonight. So if you have a free hand, if you're not holding a child or in some other way uh, preoccupied, um, if you wouldn't mind just typing into the chat um, what role you have in this community of working with deaf and hard of hearing children. Are you a parent? Are you an audiologist? Are you another kind of professional? I'm just curious to see who we have here tonight before I share my screen. Okay, we've got a couple people responded so far. Oh, we've got a lot of variety here tonight. So it looks like we have speech language pathologist, outreach consultant, college professor, interpreter, grandparents, parents, teachers, deaf mentors. Yeah, we have a lot of variety here tonight, and I'm so happy to um, be here with all of you and um, meet every one of you. Um, somebody just asked a question um, about whether they could record this. This is being recorded right now, and um, I believe it is going to be put on YouTube. Um, Cecily can talk about that a little bit later, but um, it is being recorded right now, so you don't have to worry about missing. Um, yes, we, we do. We are recording this and hopefully we're recording all of the right things in the right way. Um, I, our plan is to upload it to Montana Family ASL YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel um, tomorrow. You know, I uh, type my email address in the chat so you can reach out to me if they don't, if you don't have uh, the YouTube information, just let me know. But um, also, um, it's available to the public so you can search Montana, Montana Family ASL. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Um, it should come up in just a moment. All right, so tonight's topic is sounds, signs, and CIs. I'm gonna be talking about a bit of a potpourri of things. When I was asked to give this presentation, I was asked to talk a little bit about my own experience, and I was also asked to talk a bit about cochlear implants at a very basic level. 
and um, address some issues regarding cochlear implants and sign language. I will say before I move on to the next slide, I am not specifically going to be going over research on those topics, although I can definitely answer questions about that. Um, I planned this presentation primarily with parents in mind. If you're interested in knowing more about harder audiology content, I'm actually going to be giving a presentation on Friday at the Language First mini conference for school-based speech language pathologists. So if you're interested in um, seeing me present that kind of information, there is that option on Friday if you would like to register for that conference. So moving on, just a little bit about myself to get us started. Like Cecily introduced me, I am a deaf clinical audiologist. Um, I love being an audiologist. It brings me a great deal of joy. Um, I believe it's the perfect career for me. And the uh, primary reason that I got into audiology in the first place is my own personal experience. I think it's really important that there are audiologists in the profession who can sign with deaf and hard of hearing clients or patients who communicate primarily in a sign language. And that was something that I wanted to do, um, which is one of the major motivators for me getting into audiology in the first place. I also have other education in related areas and unrelated areas. I had an eight year career as a religious studies teacher before I changed careers to audiology. So I have some education in that area, but I also have education in early elementary education. Um, sorry, uh, early childhood education. Um, also infant toddler mental health and deaf and hard of hearing infants, toddlers, and families. So I have a master's degree in early childhood education as well. And I have a couple of graduate certificates in those other areas. Um, I've gotten some of this additional education because I believe that it's important for professionals who work with deaf and hard of hearing children to view children and families holistically um, to be able to work with a wide variety of different needs. Um, so certainly audiology is very important, but I don't think that it is the only or the most important thing in a deaf or hard of hearing child's life. So I'm interested in learning as much as I can to provide support to deaf and hard of hearing kids. Um, so I continue to pursue additional education in some of those areas. I operate an online business called Audiology Outside the Box. Some of you might be familiar with it. Maybe you found it online already. Audiology Outside the Box is what we call a telepractice in audiology. That means it's an online private practice. So um, what I do with Audiology Outside the Box is provide some of the services that there is not really time to provide and traditional audiology appointments. You go to an audiology appointment and most of the time is spent on testing or in programming devices, which are very important things. But often there's not enough time left over for actually discussing communication from a holistic perspective. So through Audiology Outside the Box, I provide audiologic counseling. I sit down with families and with individuals and talk about their communication needs and answer their questions. Um, I also provide auditory rehabilitation in a way that is ASL friendly. I'm a firm believer that a person does not have to choose one or the other, a sign language or a spoken language. You can certainly have both. And even if a person communicates primarily in a sign language and doesn't speak a spoken language, uh, they might still have goals that they want to use hearing devices for. So I want to be able to provide for those needs, and I do that also so through audiology outside the box. I'm currently working on getting some webinars up as well. So that's coming um, in the near future. I work part-time also in a traditional audiology clinic. Um, I'm a part-time audiologist um, at Gallaudet University Hearing and Speech Center. And at that clinic, I provide cochlear implant services, hearing aid services, and diagnostic testing services. 
Um, like I mentioned before, I communicate in both ASL and spoken and written English, and I switch pretty fluidly between the two languages in my daily life. Um, for work purposes, it depends on who I'm working with, what language I'm going to be communicating in at a given time. And if I'm at home, um, my spouse and I work it out depending upon our own communication needs. My spouse is hearing and is very supportive of my need <clears throat> not to be listening all the time with my ears. So if I need to sign, um, we end up signing. And if I prefer speaking and we're both on the same page with that, then that's what we're going to do at that time. So I'm pretty flexible and I love having the ability to switch back and forth between both languages. Um, like Cecily also said, I do use two cochlear implants. And um, for anyone who might be curious, manufacturer, if um, you have implants or your child has implants, I have Medell cochlear implants. So just a little bit more about my story. Um, my story is different from that of deaf and hard of hearing children. Um, so very similar to Cecily, actually, I have a progressive hearing loss. For anyone who's not familiar with what that means, um, I was born hearing and at some point I started losing my hearing. I don't exactly know when that began. I grew up in a very poor area in Eastern Kentucky. Um, there were no audiologists in the area at all at the time that I was growing up. I think even now there is only one audiology practice in the region. Uh, but I did not have access to audiologists as a child, and I only had my hearing screened at school in kindergarten. So I'm not exactly sure of when I started to lose my hearing, but it became very obvious um, in my young adulthood. Uh, there are lots of unknowns in my story, but one thing I do want to make clear uh, that I try to mention every time I do one of these presentations is because I have a progressive hearing loss and was not born deaf or hard of hearing, that is the reason that my spoken English is so good. A lot of people ask me very frequently, actually, you know, how is your English so perfect? Well, that, that's the reason. Um, it's important to know that there are differences between hearing, speech, and language. Language is what gets stored in our brains. Um, it's how we understand the input that we're getting, whether it's spoken input, signed input, written input. Um, that's language. Hearing is about the sounds that we receive. And then speech is about sounds that we can produce. Um, so as far as language goes, I developed spoken language um, right on time at all of the usual milestones that hearing children meet. I did not have to work hard to develop spoken language. Um, I started losing my hearing at some point after I had already developed spoken language. So that is an important distinction to be aware of. There are some areas where my experience would be similar to what deaf and hard of hearing children experience, but then other areas where it would be very different. Um, what I do know about my own hearing is that there is a genetic component to uh, my hearing loss. I had genetic testing actually only a couple of years ago and uh, found out that there is a genetic component. And I also have a condition called Meniere's disease. For those who are not familiar with that, it is a condition that causes fluctuating progressive hearing loss over time. And it also comes along with a lot of dizziness and balance symptoms that are really unpleasant. Um, I've had a lot of surgeries on my ears to deal with those dizziness and balance problems. Um, so that's part of my story as well. Um, and I was a hearing aid user for several years before I became a cochlear implant user. This image on the left side of the slide is actually one of my cochlear implant processors 
and a hearing aid that I used to use. Um, so I took this photo at the time when I was just implanted in my right ear and was still using a hearing aid for my left ear. Um, I really love to decorate my uh, hearing technology. I think it's um, it's very sad that hearing technology is so stigmatized. Um, I think that there should be more room for people to be proud of their technology. So um, I uh, paint. That's one of the things that I do for fun. And I have my paintings put on stickers to put on my hearing tech. Um, I was introduced to deaf culture uh, pretty early in my life, fortunately. Um, even though I was hearing or to the best of my knowledge, I was hearing during my elementary school days. Um, I had a deaf classmate. He had been in school at the Kentucky School for the Deaf for a few years. And then in the fourth grade, he transferred to my public school and he and I became friends. And I picked up a little bit of ASL from him at the time. He talked as well as signed. We communicated primarily in uh, spoken English, but he was the first person who introduced me to deaf culture. And I feel very fortunate to have grown up knowing that deaf people are proud of being deaf and have a language and a culture um, that is unique and different from hearing culture and the languages that hearing people tend to use. Um, so I do um, uh, feel a great deal of gratitude toward that friend. Um, in the age of social media, he and I have actually reconnected, and I'm glad to have him in my life again. Um, I started taking ASL more seriously as an adult, and part of the impetus for this was my own hearing decreasing more and more over time. But another part of it too is that I had another um, signing deaf friend who spent a little while being a roommate with me and my spouse. And um, we uh, started um, signing a lot more. And over a period of several years, I uh, became increasingly more and more serious about ASL. Um, I mentioned before that audiology is a second career for me, and I told you a little bit about where I had been before that, but for the audiology piece of my story, I did get my Doctor of Audiology degree from Gallaudet University, and this was an incredible experience for so many reasons. One of those is that it completely changed my views on cochlear implants. Um, when I was not yet an audiologist and was not yet in my AUD program, I had this idea that most people who got cochlear implants wanted to be hearing people, did not want to be deaf, um, did not want to have very much to do with deaf culture. Um, I thought, you know, people who get cochlear implants should definitely have that option and it's a personal choice and there was no judgment on my part against anyone who got cochlear implants. But at the time I thought, you know, people who get cochlear implants don't really want to be involved with deaf culture. And that was one of my reasons and really the primary reason that I didn't pursue cochlear implants for myself. But then I got into my AUD program and I started doing clinicals. And what I realized being on campus at Gallaudet University is that there are a lot of signing deaf people who are members of the campus community who also have cochlear implants and are still proud of themselves and still communicate in ASL, whether it's as a primary language or as a second language. Um, but I was just very fascinated by this during the very beginning of my AUD program. And as I started meeting more and more of these folks during my clinicals, I started considering that maybe my previous views on cochlear implants were not very accurate. So over time, I considered maybe getting cochlear implants would be a good idea for me. Um, I had a goal of wanting to communicate with both English speakers and ASL signers uh, equally in my clinical work. 
And I felt very strongly a desire to communicate directly in both languages with uh, both of those groups. And it was very hard for me as a hearing aid user to communicate successfully in spoken English with my English speaking clients. Um, I had no trouble producing English, um, talking and so forth, um, and using written English as well. But receptively understanding English communication from those clients was very difficult for me. Um, so I ended up actually getting both of my cochlear implants during my AUD program. Um, I look back on that now and I think I must have been out of my mind to have made that decision because the AUD program is very challenging. And getting a cochlear implant, even just one, takes a lot of time and effort and work and rehab. Um, but I did that for both, both cochlear implants during my AUD program. I got my first cochlear implant during the summer between my first and second years of school. And I got my second one during my winter break um, of my third year of my AUD program. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what is a cochlear implant in the first place? What is this technology? Um, some of you are going to be more familiar with it than others. If you have one yourself, if you have a child who has one, um, these are just a couple of images on the right side of the slide here. This blue one, um, this is the external part of the cochlear implant. It's called a sound processor. The sound processor sits on the person's ear and this little piece right here, this circular piece that's called a coil or a headpiece, um, that attaches to a magnet that is inside the person's head. So that magnet is actually here on this green piece that is the internal part of the cochlear implant. So this is the magnet. And all of this gets implanted into the person's head when they get a cochlear implant. The only piece of this that actually goes inside the cochlea in the inner ear is this tiny part right here, this very tiny curled part. That part is called the electrode array. So just some very basic information on how cochlear implants work. Um, this picture here shows it pretty well. So we have that sound processor, the external part sitting on the person's ear. We have the coil attached to the person's head uh, connected with a magnet um, in the internal device. Sorry, I keep losing my mouse. Um, so there's the internal device right there. And then the part that goes into the cochlea, if you just follow my mouse as I am moving it along here. So the electrode array here just curls around inside the cochlea. Seeing something in the chat, so I'm gonna look at that. All right, thank you for keeping uh, up with time for me. Um, so the cochlear implant electrode array is inside the cochlea here. Um, and how this works is that the microphones on the external processor pick up sounds from the environment and change them into a digital signal. Um, that processor then transfers that signal through the coil to the internal device. And then the internal device causes the little electrodes that are on the electrode array here to pulse and stimulate the hearing nerve. So that is in a nutshell how a cochlear implant works. Um, it uh, is a lot more complex than that, but at a very basic level, um, 
it has those four steps. One thing I want to point out is that it's a common myth that cochlear implants are implanted into the brain. That is not true. And one of the things you can see in this picture is that the device does not touch the brain at all. The internal device is um, seated into a little uh, well that is drilled into the bone here. And the electrode array just gets threaded through this space, which is the middle ear. Um, nothing ever touches the brain. So a cochlear implant um, is not a brain device and does not require brain surgery. So how do cochlear implants sound? This is a question that I get pretty frequently and the answer is it's complicated. There are a lot of cochlear implant simulations but the limitation of these is that they represent only the input, not how the implant sounds to the listener. So to talk a little bit more about that, to help you understand what I mean by that, um, a person's brain has to make sense of the sound input that they get from the cochlear implant. But once their brain adjusts to it, it's not going to sound the same as the input anymore. Their brain is going to do something else with it to uh, process it more thoroughly and make it hopefully more intelligible to them. Um, each cochlear implant user has their own unique experience. There is no way to know for sure how a cochlear implant sounds to every single person who uses one. Um, this video that I have here on the right side of the slide, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I am going to play a portion of it. This is one of those cochlear implant simulations that I was talking about. Again, this is not what it actually sounds like to hear through a cochlear implant, but this is the input that the person gets when they're listening to uh, through a cochlear implant. Okay, that's just a little sample. Um, if you um, were to find this video on YouTube yourself, you could listen to more examples of what the input from a cochlear implant sounds like. Um, when I listen to music myself, it does not sound like uh, the second example. <laughs> uh, the first example that you heard is what music um, would sound like to a person with typical hearing ability. And the second example is the um, cochlear implant input. Um, but that is not what music sounds like to me. Um, so definitely be um, critical when looking at these cochlear implant simulations and remember that they do not tell you what the listener experience is going to be like. But the reason that I showed you this simulation just very briefly is that another aspect that's important to remember is that cochlear implant users are constantly having to work very hard to make sense of the input that we're getting. And if you think about the kind of input that we're getting, that music sample, right? Um, that would be a lot of hard work for the brain to sort through. Um, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about cochlear implant listening and the benefits and limitations of devices as you may be talking about those with people in your life, professionals that you're working with. Um, the kind of signal that is in this video um, is a pretty good example of the kind of input that a person might get.
Okay, so a little bit more about this issue of how cochlear implants sound. Um, you might be wondering about those viral cochlear implant activation videos that you see on YouTube or you see on social media. Um, I'll be honest that I'm not a fan of those videos. I am highly critical of those videos. And the reason for that is that I think they give the impression that cochlear implant hearing is sort of a boom, you get it activated and now you're a hearing person situation. And that is not the case in reality. Um, what the viral cochlear implant activation videos don't show is all of the work that the person has to do after getting the implant in order to be able to understand speech through the implant. Um, even if a person has already had spoken language before getting their implant, it's not necessarily going to be the case that they get the implant activated and then suddenly they hear very clearly. My own cochlear implant activation experience was very different for the right ear and for the left ear. For the right ear, which was my first, um, I had a very bad day on my activation day. Um, there were some things that um, did not necessarily go very well at that activation. And it was a really highly emotional experience for me in a negative way. I was stressed out and crying for a great deal of my activation and not from happiness. Um, the sound quality for me sounded, um, I would describe it as sounding like ET um, for about three months after I got that first implant. Um, the scene in the movie E.T. where he's saying home, phone, it sounded like that to me for the first three months uh, with my implant, regardless of who was talking to me. Um, it's a pretty common experience to have a very odd sort of sound quality, not just on the activation day, but also for a period after the activation. It takes a person's brain a while to adjust to the device. So that's something to keep in mind. Most people do not hear clearly on their activation day. Um, I have activated people who have told me that they hear pretty clearly on their activation day, but I would say that that's not been very many people. Um, most people hear a very strange sort of sound quality. Um, people commonly describe it as a Mickey Mouse sound or um, on the other end of the frequency spectrum, some people would describe it as a Darth Vader type sound. For me, it was ET. Um, so most people do not hear clearly on the day that they are activated. And it is very important to know that cochlear implants do not provide normal hearing even after your brain adjusts to the device. Um, this is something that I think a lot of misleading information um, tends to be given about. One thing that a lot of parents that I have talked to have expressed concern about is that they got the impression from either one of their providers or from someone else that they met, maybe another parent of a deaf or hard of hearing child or somebody else in their lives, that cochlear implants essentially make deaf and hard of hearing children into hearing children. And that's not the case. There are always going to be difficulties in listening with cochlear implants, regardless of how well you do with them. There will always be situations where a person struggles. Um, so cochlear implant hearing is not the same thing as typical hearing ability, which is very important to keep in mind. And then just a little fun fact that I put on this slide. Um, I, I find it a bit funny that this image on the right side of the slide, this woman with the tattoos here, um, her video uh, was, I believe, the first major activation video in that whole genre of online cochlear implant activation videos. Um, interestingly, though, this is not actually a cochlear implant activation, and her device is not a cochlear implant. Um, she's actually having a middle ear implant activated, and a middle ear implant is a device for a totally different purpose. Um, it is a device that some people qualify for 
if they would qualify for hearing aids, but something keeps them from being able to use hearing aids in the medical sense. So for example, some people who have constant chronic, very serious outer ear infections, but would qualify for hearing aids might get a middle ear implant. So that's what she's having activated here. It's not actually a cochlear implant, it's a middle ear implant. Um, and just a couple more perspectives that you can look up on your own when you have time. How cochlear implants sound um, will be different to different individuals. Uh, my friend and colleague, another deaf audiologist who uses cochlear implants, Tina Childress, um, she has a website called See Here Communication Matters. And um, one thing that she does is create videos about hearing technologies of different kinds. And she has a video about her own listening experience with cochlear implants and how that changed from her activation all the way up to now. Um, so I highly recommend watching that video. And then I've also provided a link here to the activation of my own second cochlear implant. So um, since I got both implants while I was studying for my doctor of audiology degree, I decided that I was going to film my second activation for the purpose of providing education. Um, so I did that. This is a pretty long video. It's about 35 minutes long, but it goes through the entire process of the cochlear implant activation um, in a summarized sort of way. The actual activation appointment takes a couple of hours, so it's pretty long, but I have cut it down to 35 minutes. This video is in ASL, but I also voiced it over in spoken English and there are captions as well. There is an audio description um, and there is a transcript for deafblind viewers. So um, you can definitely feel free to watch that. All right. So a little bit about my cochlear implant hearing ability. I like to use this as an example when I'm telling people that cochlear implants are not necessarily what they might think. Um, this audiogram on the right side of the slide, this is actually my aided audiogram with my two cochlear implants. For those who have not had an audiogram explained to them before, um, along this axis here, this left side of the chart, that shows what we call intensity which is pretty similar to loudness. So this is how loud the sound is. The softer sounds are at the top of the audiogram and then the louder sounds are at the bottom. So a person who is profoundly deaf, their unaided audiogram without any kinds of hearing aids or cochlear implants is going to be down here in the bottom of the chart in this range that's the profound or severe to profound range. Um, but up here on the top, this is what we call frequency. It's pretty similar to the idea of pitch. So sounds with different pitches like a drum beating might be a low pitch sound or a bird singing might be a high pitch sound. So the low pitch sounds are over here on the left and then the high pitch sounds are over here on the right. So all of these points on the audiogram show the softest level where I can hear at each of those pitches with my two cochlear implants. The blue L's are for my left implant and the red R's are for my right implant. So what you can see here is that I am in what we would call the mild range for both of my cochlear implants. And that's exactly where cochlear implant users are supposed to be with um, aided thresholds in the booth, the mild range. So just take a moment to think a little bit about what you would predict about my hearing ability for speech from seeing this. Some of you may have an idea in mind. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn to the next slide here and tell you a little bit about what it actually is. 
So my right and left cochlear implants have vastly different outcomes. My left cochlear implant far outperforms my right cochlear implant. Um, so these are just some examples of percent correct scores that I got in a quiet listening situation in the audiology booth with my left implant and with my right implant. And you can see that with my left implant, I'm in the 80s and 90s for um, both words and for sentences, which is really good. And also for speech sounds. Um, with cochlear implant users, we want to see something that is 60% or better because that um, would give the person better than what they got with hearing aids. So with my left implant, those scores are very good. But then my right implant, these scores are not so great. <laughs> um, so I only got 36% of the single syllable words and 54% of the speech sounds, and then right at 60% for words in sentences. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that the aided audiogram is a very poor predictor of performance with cochlear implants for speech understanding. A person can have the exact same aided audiogram for both of their cochlear implant ears, and those two ears can perform completely differently. Um, in the same way, you could have two different people with cochlear implants who have the exact same aided audiogram and they have totally different speech understanding abilities. And then a little bit more, what I showed you on the previous slide was my scores in quiet situations. What about when we add noise? Noise is something that we deal with in life on a regular basis. All the time we are dealing with noise. Often the noise that we listen to is louder than what we're actually trying to hear. Sometimes the noise and what we're interested in hearing are pretty similar. Sometimes the noise is louder. But with my cochlear implants, in a situation where the sentences were 10 decibels louder than the noise. Um, so a good bit louder than the noise. That knocked my sentence recognition score down for my left cochlear implant to 65%. And then when we added even more noise so that the sentences were only five decibels louder than the noise, I only got 40% of the words right in the sentences. And that's for my better ear. That's for my better cochlear implant. And then for the right, we couldn't even test with sentences at only five decibels louder because when the sentences were 10 decibels louder, I only got 30% correct with my right ear. So if we think about this, in a lot of situations, like I said, the noise will be louder than what it is that we're trying to listen to. In these test conditions, the sentences are actually a little bit louder than the noise, and I'm still missing quite a lot. So cochlear implants provide a lot of great access, but at the same time, they do not provide perfect hearing ability, and they do not provide um, the ability for a person to be just like a hearing person. So some things that you might have been told about cochlear implants. Um, one of the common messages that people get is that cochlear implant users are normal or not deaf because we are part of the hearing world. Um, another common idea that gets tossed around out there is that cochlear implant users don't have a disability and don't need accommodations and that we don't need sign languages. Then there is the idea that sign language exposure actually causes delays in spoken language development for children who use cochlear implants, and that sign languages limit deaf people's world and cochlear implants are what broadens deaf people's world. So these are just some things to consider, and I could definitely answer more specific questions about these items as uh, we get into the question and answer piece. Appearing not deaf 
is very different from being a hearing person. I tell people all the time that um, they have to consider, I do not hear as well as I talk. This is something that is a constant battle for me as a cochlear implant user. I am on a regular basis having to remind people that, hey, I do not hear you and I do not hear you um, as well as I can speak in this situation. Um, it is difficult to get accommodations sometimes because people hear me speak and they assume that I hear just as well as I talk. Uh, but cochlear implant users um, often have to deal with situations in life where we don't hear very well and people around us don't recognize that. Um, so that's something to consider. Also, many cochlear implant users require accommodations for access in different places. Um, so getting a cochlear implant does not mean that you don't um, need accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act or one of the other disability laws. I use accommodations and I'll be telling you about that in the slide to come. But um, nearly every cochlear implant user that I work with as an audiologist also uses accommodations. So it is certainly not the case that the norm is you get a cochlear implant and you don't need any accommodations. Consider also that sign languages are not accommodations, they're languages. Now having a sign language interpreter for a situation, that interpreter is an accommodation, but sign languages like ASL are actual languages. And I think if we start talking about ASL as a language in the same way as we talk about English as a language, we'll be able to discuss some of these issues a lot better. Um, ASL is not just a fallback. It's not just something that you can do if spoken English doesn't work out. And it's not just something that you're given as uh, something additional. Um, the idea that sign language exposure may support spoken language development has started to come out in some smaller scale research studies. Um, there is more research that is needed on this topic, but there is some evidence that um, sign language exposure may support the development of spoken languages. And also knowing more than one language expands your communication opportunities, which actually expands your world rather than limits your world. Um, I think a lot of people are under the impression that being a signer means that um, you have to communicate only in ASL and never communicate in any other way. Um, personally, I think that everybody should be free to communicate in the ways that work best for them. And um, if that were more the case, uh, people would probably communicate a whole lot more smoothly in life in general. But one of the things that I tell people when I'm working with them for cochlear implants, if they're signers or if they are considering uh, learning ASL or considering ASL for their child, um, I tell them there are a lot of advantages to knowing ASL if you also know spoken English. Um, for example, I do not hear well enough on the phone to use the phone just in spoken English. Um, I could use a caption phone, but there is a delay that's pretty significant on the captions. The way that I prefer to talk on the phone is using video relay service, where I get an interpreter to interpret the phone call to me. And I actually use my own voice and speak English to the person on the other end of the line. But that's an option with video relay service. And it's an option that's open to you if you know ASL. If you don't, then that option is not open. Um, so that's one example, but there are many areas of life where I have found knowing ASL to be very much an advantage and very much expanding to my world. Um, and this is just a list of some accommodations that I use in my everyday life um, for work, for um, classes in the PhD program where I'm currently studying. Um, and even at home, 
So for meetings and for classes, sometimes I have ASL interpreters, sometimes I have CART captioning. If you're not familiar with CART, it is a uh, service where a person who is a trained court reporter um, uses um, a special keyboard to type out captions for the meeting or for the class. I also have a microphone system that I use right now. Incidentally, it is plugged into my computer so that I can hear audio through my computer. And um, part of the system is around my neck as well. This is my receiver for the microphone system. Um, I mentioned VRS and VRI. VRS is video relay service. And VRI is video remote interpreting, um, which is what I get for extra um, communication support when I go to medical appointments, especially now that we're in COVID times and everybody is wearing masks and I can't um, speech read. Um, I use note takers. Um, when I am taking classes, I get note taking services. Um, there's another student who takes notes and then gives me the notes at the end of class. And those notes help me to fill in places that I might have missed. Um, before meetings, I get ad, uh, advanced written materials and um, that way I can plan and prepare. I have clear masks that I can give to my clients and patients that I work with clinically, um, particularly at my part-time clinical job where I'm doing more traditional audiology. I have a specialized listening scope, which is in the picture on the left side of the slide here. As an audiologist, I need to be able to do listening checks on other people's hearing aids and cochlear implants. And this is how I do it. So this is my microphone and this is a just a carrying case. Um, but I have this little plunger here that I modified from an iPhone stand. And I have a couple of little suction cups and a piece of hearing aid tubing in it. <laughs> and the microphone ports on top of the microphone, I just put this plunger on top of them. And then I will put the um, person's hearing aid into that little suction cup. And I'll be able to listen to the hearing aid with um, this on top of the microphone and be able to hear it right into my microphone, which streams to my cochlear implants, which is really nice. And there are also a lot of task modifications that I, um, uh, that I use in my daily work as an audiologist. And I can talk more about that in the question and answer if you're interested. But um, I have found that there is not an audiology task that I can't modify in some way as a deaf person. Um, so I'm just gonna close this part with me talking before the question and answer with some general suggestions that I have for families. One would be keep an open mind about language and communication for your child. You never know what is going to be beneficial. And you might be surprised at what's beneficial. Um, a lot of families have a goal for their child to learn spoken English, and that is fine. There is nothing wrong with wanting your child to learn spoken English. But um, there are other things that can be beneficial. ASL is also a beneficial language to have. There are also beneficial tools like cued speech, for example. Also, think about hearing technologies as tools rather than cures. Um, hearing technologies are wonderful. They provide a lot of great access. They give so much opportunity to access sound, but they do not make people hearing. And if we view them as tools rather than cures, we can keep expectations a lot more realistic. Also, consider that sign languages and hearing technologies are not opposites. You can have both. And there is no reason that a person cannot have both. Prioritize language development as a whole. So regardless of what kind of language your child is getting, language feeds the brain. And language, no matter whether it is spoken, signed, or written, helps with development of more language. Um, what a child learns in one language is going to lay a good foundation for them learning another language. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And then lastly, let your child show you who they are and what they need as they grow. Um, children change a lot as they grow. I've seen kids 
go through different stages with what they prefer language and communication wise. And the more options you keep open for them, the more options they will have as they get older and as they grow and as they show you who they are and what they need. So now I am open to your questions. Um, I will say before I start questions that I will send the PowerPoint to, um, or I'll send a PDF of the PowerPoint to Cecily along with some slides I'm going to put at the end with some resources for you. And those resources will hopefully be helpful um, for um, either working with um, deaf and hard of hearing children and families, or if you are a parent um, thinking about uh, what you're doing with your own child. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop my screen share now and we'll start the question and answer. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was amazing. A round of applause for Sarah. We do have one question that came up during the presentation. Um, and I would answer it, but I realized I don't know. So you talked about the middle ear implant. Um, is that the same as a Baja, a bone? Uh, a bone anchored hearing aid? Is that the same? That's an excellent question. Those are actually two different devices. So a bone anchored hearing aid or a bone conduction hearing aid is for people whose hearing levels are what we call conductive or mixed. Um, sometimes they're also used for people who are deaf in one ear but um, have a hearing ear on the other side. Um, but a bone conduction implant or a uh, bone anchored hearing aid, the purpose of that is to take the sound and vibrate it into the skull bone. And that's how the sound is delivered to the person. Um, the middle ear implant is not, um, it's not the same device and it's not as common either. Um, there aren't very many people with middle ear implants because the need for them tends to be pretty rare. Um, like I said in the presentation, they tend to be for people who would qualify for hearing aids but have a medical reason for not being able to use hearing aids. They're a lot more common in Europe than they are in the United States. In the United States, they're not even approved for children. They're only approved for adults. Um, but the middle ear implant is essentially um, for someone who would otherwise qualify for a traditional hearing aid, but for a medical reason, they can't use one. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to open it up to everybody. Um, I have um, written down several questions that I have um, that I'm curious that I wanted to ask Sarah, but understand I'm not a parent of a deaf child. So I want to, you know, give it, open the floor up to the parents if anybody wants to ask Sarah um, any questions uh, or for clarification. Okay, Agnes. Okay, now if other people, hold on, hold on, Agnes, hold on for just a sec. Um, if other people, if you would like to ask a question, please either type it, your, your comment in the chat, or your question in the chat. If you don't want your, your face to be shown on the recording or, or, or like Agnes, you're on the recording right now, sorry. <laughs> Okay, and uh, or you can click on uh, the reactions at the bottom if, if you see and you could see the raise your hand a feature and I'll call on you when it's your turn. Okay, if you do have any other questions either either way. Okay, go ahead, Agnes. Okay, right, so this is Agnes and I'm going to talk because um, my ASL is um, I'm working on it. <laughs> um, but thank you, Sarah. That was a really awesome presentation. I learned a lot. And um, I'm the mother of June, who's 22 months old, and she is deaf. Um, she's got profound hearing loss in both ears. And we've got one cochlear implant, and we're um, hoping to get a second one this summer. Um, so I have two questions for you. 
One was about um, your slides when you were talking about your um, CIs, and I just found it really interesting that, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like this, the second one that you got is your left ear, and that's working better than the first one. So um, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, in anticipation of June getting her second one, um, you know, do you know why one works better than the other? And is it like, I guess, what was the time difference between the two? And um, I just thought, found it really interesting that this, the one, the second one that got implanted is the one that's working better. Um, and then my second question after you're done with that has to do with like therapies um, that I just kind of wanted to pick your brain about real quick. Okay, sure. Um, that first question is an excellent question. And uh, yes, I do have an idea of why the outcomes are different between my two ears. So there are a lot of factors that play into cochlear implant outcomes. Um, one of those is medical conditions that affect the ears or affect the auditory system in some way. Um, so in my case, um, for my right ear, I've had a lot more surgery on that ear before getting implanted than I've had on my left. Um, I've also had brain surgery on the right side of my head. Okay. And both of those things have probably contributed to the cochlear implant outcome on the right side. Okay. Um, it's a lot more common actually for people who get one implant first and the second implant later to favor their first rather than their second. So I'm sort of the opposite of that. Um, with smaller children, um, if they get both of them when they're very young, it's different. There's a lot more time to adjust uh, throughout their lives to both devices. But when an adult or when an older child gets implanted in one ear and then later gets implanted in another, um, it's a lot more common for them to favor the first one rather than the second. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, and yeah, my other question was about, um, you know, June has a lot of therapies right now, like speech therapy and LSL and ASL for me and, you know, for her as well. Um, and I'm just, and then I work full time. And so then in the afternoons, if I'm not in therapy, then I'm like playing with her, trying to like listen to all of the different therapists ideas. And sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like there's just a lot going on. Um, and so I, I'm trying to raise her. We're trying to raise her, my family and I, um, with ASL and spoken language. And I mean, I'm, I'm hearing parents, so I'm trying to do both. And I don't know any advice on the best way to expose her to both. Like we do some time where it's voices off, hands up, but that's not like all day long. And so we kind of just do a lot of both of signs and, and spoken language. And she's picking up quite a bit of signs right now, more than um, words, which I think is, you know, pretty typical for this age, but I don't know any advice and this, we could also maybe take this offline too about just the best kind of therapy options for raising a child bilingual. That's a wonderful question. This is Cicely. Um, I wanted to add just a little bit of context to that. Um, in Montana, uh, we typically, uh, the audi audiologist and speech therapist recommend uh, them to, re that they're recommended to the family. Um, they recommend um, co the cochlears are on and then they're listening for the full time all day, all day long. Um, when you wake up, you put the cochlear implants in and you have them in all day as much as possible. You're, they're just listening all day, trying to get in as much sound as possible. I have recommended to families that I disagree with that. I think that um, hearing some of the time and taking off the cochlear implants part of the time, like signing, while you have the cochlear implants off. Um, that, you know, so people in Montana have been conflicting advice. Um, so they're getting advice that are conflicting with the audiologist and the speech therapist, you know, and what they're telling the families, so. 
Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I think that's an issue in a lot of areas. And, um, you know, I want to say to Agnes, um, I think it's wonderful that you are giving so many language and communication opportunities to June. That is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Because like I said in the presentation, um, all language feeds the brain, um, whether it's spoken, whether it's signed, whether it's written, all of that is going to build a strong foundation. Um, if, um, a child is given access to it. So that, that's awesome. Um, one thing that I, um, would have as a general suggestion for families, because I can't, um, I can't speak to a specific situation if I'm not your own audiologist, but um, a general uh, suggestion I would have for families in your situation um, is to consider family language planning. I'm not sure if anyone has told you about family language planning. Um, essentially, it is setting up a plan for day to day when you're going to use one language, when you're going to use another language. Um, what different modalities you're going to use at different times. I actually have on my website some um, downloadable resources for family language planning if you are interested. But um, I found that in families that I work with, um, that can be a really helpful tool actually making a plan during the day to ensure that the child is getting um, exposure and access in all of the languages and modalities that the family is using. Um, so I am a big fan of family language planning, and I think that's something that can really contribute to um, a child's life and to a family's life as you all um, learn more about who your children are as they grow. Um, so I, I would certainly, certainly um, say that family language planning is something to consider. Also, I would urge everyone to consider that having cochlear implants on doesn't necessarily mean that you have to communicate in spoken language the entire time that you're on. There are times when I have my processors on, but I'm signing and I'm not actually listening through them. Um, so that's an option as well for certain times during the day when you're signing and you're not talking. Um, I do think as an audiologist, it is important to get kids adjusted to having the processors on so that um, they become sort of a natural part of their daily experience. Um, but having them on doesn't necessarily mean that you have to communicate only in spoken language. And I think that's a distinction that sometimes gets missed. Um, and then what I would say beyond that is um, I am going to add some resources to my PowerPoint, and I think some of the resources I'm going to add could be helpful for the kind of situation that you're describing. Um, so I will send that to Cecily as soon as I have those resources slides ready, and um, you can always feel free to contact me if you have a question about them. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, just to clarify to everyone, CAN or Conservatory ASL Northwest, the website will be posting um, all of the information, all of the links and resources and everything related to this session. So, um, I just put that um, Sarah's website um, in the chat, but I will uh, compile a list of all the links, the videos, the resources that um, we will provide. And the PowerPoint will be available on the CANS website. So if you don't have that information, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to share that with you. And um, you'll be able to access that and get more information, more resources and so forth. Okay. Um, anyone else have any questions for Sarah? Maybe you're thinking about it, you can type it in the chat. 
And while you're doing that, I do have several questions that I'd like to ask. So one is that, Sarah, you had mentioned having the cochlear implants on to practice hearing, to practice listening. I'm curious, have you been telling parents that it's good to have some time with the cochlear implants off? And the reason I ask that is I, I'm just, you know, speaking from my personal knowledge and my gut instinct, I, and I may be wrong, but let's say the battery dies or does it break something? Or, you know, what if um, the person goes swimming? I don't know what they do with that. I've never experienced that. So should they take the cochlear implants off? And how does that process function when they're out in the world? And do you advise parents to um, keep them on constantly so as to practice hearing? Or do the kids need to know how to interact with the world without having the cochlear implants on, just saying. What would you, what, what advice do you give? Those are all fantastic questions. Um, so there's a difficult balance uh, to achieve here. And that's something I'm always aware of when I'm working with cochlear implant users, whether it's an adult, whether uh, we're talking about an older child or a younger child. Um, what I typically recommend for the families that I work with is to have the processors on during what I call most waking hours. And the reason I say it that way is most is different from all, first of all. Um, but secondly, um, we do have research um, that suggests that children with hearing devices, hearing aids, or cochlear implants um, get the most benefit from those devices when they are worn approximately 10 hours a day, if not more. Now, that can be really difficult when a child is very young and taking a lot of naps, and sometimes that's not achievable for a child who is that young. But I try to tell families, you know, if spoken language is part of your goals, then getting to 10 hours of wear time a day is what we would like to shoot for. Um, that's something that can take a little bit of time to get to, um, but we can work together and we can assess things at every visit and keep talking about this. Um, and we can also talk about what to do when your child needs a break. Um, I know as a cochlear implant user that needing a break is something that sometimes happens. Um, I get really exhausted sometimes from listening. And sometimes I do need to take my processors off. Um, sometimes if I'm using them during the workday, I will need to take them off for a little bit at lunch. Sometimes if I'm using them for some other purpose, I will take them off as soon as that meeting is over or as soon as I've finished that particular obligation where I was using them. Um, I think that over time, people find cochlear implant use patterns that work for them. Um, but we also have to balance that with the fact that with young children, they haven't developed spoken language yet. Now, obviously, global language development, whether spoken, signed, written, what have you, is the most important goal. But if part of that is going to be spoken language, um, then using those processors is something that's necessary. Um, I would say that with the families I work with, there's a bit of an organic nature to the process. Um, what I just outlined is my general approach. Um, that's not something that is going to be the same necessarily for every family. And it's also not um, a recommendation that I am giving for um, families that I'm not working with as your audiologist. I don't know what your situation is individually, so I can't speak to that. Um, but something I am very aware of in working with families is that there needs to be some sort of balance between the needs if spoken language is one of the goals. And then um, to answer your question about swimming, 
There is an option for all three of the cochlear implant manufacturers um, called Waterware. Um, it's essentially a little jacket that you can put over top of your processor. And if you want to wear it while swimming, you can. Um, Advanced Bionics has a waterproof processor option. Um, so there's an off the ear processor called the Neptune that um, you can actually uh, just clip onto the child's swimsuit. And then the headpiece um, just has a really long cord from it that uh, goes up to their head. Um, and in that case, the child can actually wear the processor without that water wear jacket into the pool if they're swimming or into the bathtub. Um, but people have different preferences for this. Um, swimming is actually something that I enjoy very much. I swim for exercise. I do lap swimming. I go completely sound off when I swim. I do not have an interest in using water wear for my processors while I'm in the pool because I don't really want to hear while I'm in the pool. But for a young child who's taking swimming lessons, um, maybe they need to be able to hear the person that they're working with, or maybe um, they need to be able to hear their parent. Um, every situation is gonna be different. I hope that helped a little bit with your questions. <laughs> Yes, and I wanted to clarify and also reiterate something that Sarah mentioned uh, that she can't provide individual advice to families. She's not licensed in Montana to do that, but I do want to talk with her if she could possibly become licensed in Montana and, and then do some sort of telehealth, but um, she's not able to give you specific advice for your family. So we're not gonna have any of that tonight. So this is just a general discussion, okay? We do have a few more questions that have come up in the chat box. And I'm going to um, present three of them together because they seem to be related. First, cochlear implants and balance, do they affect balance? How much hearing loss is needed to qualify for a cochlear implant? And if a child has an intellectual disability or is delayed, are they still a candidate for a cochlear implant or not? All excellent questions. You all are asking such great questions tonight. So for the first one, that's actually one of my areas of research interest, cochlear implants and balance. Um, cochlear implants can affect balance. Um, the extent to which they do is something that is still being researched. Um, the answer to the question has also changed a bit as cochlear implant surgical technique has improved. It used to be that cochlear implant surgery um, led to a loss of all residual hearing for every person who got implanted. And then at the same time, a lot of the ears balance organs were destroyed. But cochlear implant surgical technique has improved a lot. And it has been possible for several years now to preserve residual hearing for some people who get cochlear implants. And along with that, it's become more possible to preserve that balance function from the ear. Um, so I would say that for now, based on what we know, yes, cochlear implants can affect balance. Um, the long-term effects of that in children remain to be seen. We, um, do not have enough research on that yet. We do have some preliminary research suggesting that children who get cochlear implants have poorer functional balance than hearing children, but we don't know if that is the case when they're compared to children who are deaf but do not have cochlear implants. This is a really complicated issue because there are many causes of deafness that can also cause losses of balance um, function themselves. So one example is cytomegalovirus, CMV. If um, you have CMV, there's a pretty good likelihood that you're going to have balance problems just because of the CMV, whether you have a cochlear implant or not. 
Um, same thing with meningitis. Meningitis is very likely to lead to balance problems. And then there are certain genetic causes like Usher syndrome as well that come along with balance problems. So sorting all of that out, how much of it is the implant and how much of it is the cause of the child's deafness that leads to balance difficulties, that's something that's still being researched and something that I am interested in researching myself. Um, the question about the amount of hearing loss or reduced hearing that is necessary for a cochlear implant, that's a little bit more fluid than um, you would think by looking at the FDA criteria for cochlear implants. Um, the criteria are different for young children and for older children and for adults. Um, as far as FDA criteria go, um, now children as young as nine months can be implanted um, if they are profoundly deaf. Um, there are children who actually get implanted earlier than nine months. Um, one of the reasons that this ends up happening is that the FDA only regulates devices. It doesn't regulate recommendations made by medical professionals. So when we see research that supports something innovative and new and different, um, for example, such as implanting a child who's a little bit younger than the FDA criterion, um, that's something that can sometimes be justified. Same thing with adults and with older children go. Um, it really depends on the situation. For young children, um, being in the severe to profound range is usually where we start looking at cochlear implantation. There are certain causes of deafness that are um, likely to lead the child to become a cochlear implant candidate later if they aren't already. So sometimes um, if a family's in one of those situations, we'll start talking about it a little bit earlier before the child actually gets to severe to profound. For older children and adults, we tend to go um, by both hearing levels and by speech discrimination ability. If a person is not getting 60% um, or better with speech discrimination with hearing aids, it's likely in a lot of cases that they will do better with cochlear implants. So um, that's an important criterion that we look at. And then um, very quick answer to the last part, is a child still a candidate for a cochlear implant if they have intellectual disability? Um, yes, they can still be a candidate, but expectations really need to be discussed with regard to the child's uh, disability and the child's um, strengths. So when I'm working with a family of a child who has intellectual disability or autism or some other kind of disability beyond deafness, um, I think it's very important to talk with the family about how that other disability may impact the outcome and give them as much information as I can about that based on the available research so that they can make an informed decision about whether going ahead with the implant is a good choice for their family. And you know, some families um, want their child to have some level of sound access, even if that doesn't mean they develop spoken language even if they're only able to have sound awareness with their cochlear implant. Some families want that. Um, other families say, well, if um, spoken language is not going to be very likely for my child, then maybe we don't want to do this. So um, it really depends on the situation. But yes, children with intellectual disability can still be candidates. Great. OK, well. We are out of time for our session for tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sparks. Thank you to the two interpreters. And also thank you very much to our awesome captionist who has been uh, Mary Belt, Mary, I cannot pronounce the name, <laughs> but, um, we need to say goodbye for now, but uh, 
If you haven't already followed us on Facebook, please do join our group. I type that into the chat box. And you can also send us an email and we'll follow up. And we'll be posting this recording of this meeting. And we'll post several links as well. And also a copy uh, to access Dr. Sparks PowerPoint slide deck so you can look through that. So again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you all later. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, June.